the Know Your Gear podcast. Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to the Know Your Gear podcast episode 345. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. I'm excited. Another week went by and it's the first episode of the new year, 2024. So I hope you guys are excited. <laughs> I'm excited. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff to talk about. Got a lot of emails this week uh, on the um, on the website, the www know your gear podcast website where you can submit questions that might possibly get seen on episodes and um also uh we have a lot of stuff coming up this month because boy is it a doozy it's the nam month so much cool stuff so you guys got subjects i got subjects we got stuff to talk about that's great uh the first thing i want to talk about is it's a new year and i know a lot of you are going to have a new this is going to sound like a commercial it's a little bit of a commercial but it's a cool commercial uh I'm sure it's a new year. You guys want some, you got some uh, New Year's resolutions. Well, we did this last year and I, I, we got to do it again, which is what? What are we going to do? Um, if you guys recall, last year we did the Tim Pierce uh, kind of collaboration master course. So if you guys know Tim Pierce, of course you know Tim Pierce. He does this master class. And more importantly, um, over the years that you guys are like, oh man, your guitar player has gotten better. And I've always said like, yeah, maybe my editing's got better. But if you guys remember, I took this course right before last in, in 2023 or 2022, 2022. I took it in 2022 and uh, man, it improved my playing so much. In fact, that's why I'm doing my little EP album and stuff. And uh, so Tim reached out and basically, hey, um, he wanted to share this again with you guys. Something cool. Here's what it is. Uh, if you guys sign up, if you guys use the link down below, if you are members of my channel, you get 30% off. It makes $100 instead of $149-ish, you know, right? So 30% off that. But more importantly, um, you get to try it for two weeks for free. So it's a 14-day trial, no no trickery, no nothing. Check it out. Um, it doesn't hold you back. It doesn't like show you a preview course. I mean, you can get in there and check it out for two weeks. But what we're gonna do is what we did last year, which was super successful. If you sign up for this course, you get to hang out with me and Tim when we do a live kind of, uh, it's an interactive uh, clinic. We did this last year too. But more importantly, if you did this program last year, you get to join that course as well too, or that class. So if you're joined last year and you don't want to re-up, that's, I understand, you can join. Also, if you want to re-up, you also get the discount. Also, this discount, I guess, is for life. So it's 30% off forever. So if you guys want to do it, but all of that is important, but it's more important to say, not only are we supporting Tim, which is it's one of my favorite YouTubers of all time, and uh, I think I've all shared with you guys many times how I met him, but more importantly, uh, they're going to they're gonna not only give you 30% off, they're going to kick a little bit back to the channel of me. So if you guys sign up, not only do I get to hang out with you, but also you guys are helping this channel too. So of course, we need to do this. We need to, uh, uh, we're going to do it. Okay, so... Let's see. Um, oh, there's hiss. Is that what you guys are saying? There's hiss in the sound. Huh. A white noise in the audio. Do you guys still hear it? Ah, it's better. Okay. I should have fixed it. Okay. So hopefully that's better. So there was a secondary mic. So it should be gone now because I was a secondary mic on. Yep, it's gone now. Okay, cool. Uh, that's technical difficulties. We got to have that, right? Uh, the uh, I was re uh, recording another podcast today and there was two mics on and now there's only one mic on. So the uh, mic needed to be turned off. All right, so uh, let's get into the show. We'll talk about more about the course, of course. But more importantly, I want to hit some of these questions that came in during the week. And uh, let's let's do that. Let me see where I have that. And uh, some early riser questions. But more importantly, these were some ones that came in through uh, the mail. And uh, uh, this one says, "Cheers, Phil." It says, uh, "Have you ever have you ever had a piece of gear or gear that that you liked or you own? I would imagine like or own uh, that was dissed by a favorite artist. I saw Joe Bonamassa interview where he was." saying he doesn't like the Silver Jubilee reissues. I guess he works on a different budget. Yeah, of course, right? He, yeah, definitely, he gets to do the, the real ones. That one's from Bruce. 
Um, you know, probably, uh, you know, one thing I can actually probably one up that not only have I heard artists probably say they didn't like a piece of gear that I love, but more importantly, I've interviewed artists and, uh, you know, I'm like, Hey, like this, it's great. Right. And they're like, nah. um, but you know, what's great about that question is it's not so much like, you know, if somebody doesn't like what you like, is that a problem? It's always reminds me how one person can feel, uh, find a need for something or, or find something they love. And, uh, basically somebody else doesn't love it. I've told this story before, but it's the fastest analogy I have, which is, uh, the, the Vox AC, uh, 13 and uh, 13, Vox AC 15 and the Vox AC 30, uh, especially the uh, Vox AC 30. I like the 30 more than the 15, but more importantly, um, it's an amp that I've tried to love and I absolutely love it when other guitar players play through it. But for me, it just never does the magic. I always plug into it and I get no magic. And, uh, and, and my favorite part of this story was once at the store, um, there was one on, on the floor, an AC 30, a guitar player played in and it was the most magical sound I think I've ever heard. And I was like, this is, this is it. And he put the guitar back on the wall and he left the store and I ran up, I grabbed his guitar, I plugged in farts, <laughs> just nothing. Uh, and, uh, it's just how it works and that's, what's great. And that's why it's important that, you know, I like the gear discussion, talking about all this stuff that we love more so than this kind of authority of like, this is good and this is bad. And that's just the final word on that. Uh, you know, somebody loves a metal zone and somebody hates it. And that's just how it goes. So, and, um, and you know, John Bonamassa, Joe Bonamassa is probably right. I bet you if he said, man, a real super silver Jubilee with a real 15 and less Paul sounds like better than the reissue then. A, and a reissue jub jubilee, but uh, you know, the truth is the rest of us are never gonna know that, we'll find that to be the, the case. Uh, so there you go. Um, what else we got? We have, uh, why do many of my guitars uh, drift sharp, not flat? Oh, okay, cool. Uh, when uh, While simply sitting on the stands in my room where the temperature and humidity is consistent. So, you know, what's gonna cause your guitars to go sharp? My first experience, you know, with a customer saying my guitar keeps going out of tune, but sharp, not flat, was a Gibson SG. In fact, it actually made me not try or play SGs for years um, because I feel like a lot of times SGs, especially thinner neck SGs, would come in for repair with them going uh, out of tune sharp. And uh, it, I later found it wasn't an SG issue, but it's just more, you know, more likely to happen on your Gibson SGs. What's happening is, is as the neck pitches back, it's stretching the strings. And so what's causing that is the neck is shifting. That's what it does. And especially a thinner neck and the way the SG's neck joint is and just the overall way the design of the guitar. I've said this many times on my PRS Mirror, which is behind me, one of my favorite guitars of all time. It's kind of like Paul Reesmith's version of SG in my mind. Um, and uh, it's one of my favorite guitars in the world, but it, it is my least stable guitar. It, it does go out of tune. If the weather gets cold, it's going to go out of tune. If the <laughs> the weather gets hot, it goes out of tune. Um, I don't know why that is. And I've tried to replace it many times with other mirrors that didn't do the problem that mine does, but I just love that mirror so much. So yeah, going sharp isn't uh, uh, unique or problematic. It's guitars can go out of tune and go sharp uh, just as easy as they can go flat. So the difference though, is that generally speaking, if they're going flat, it's because uh, they're binding in the nut or the tuning key is slipping or the string is slipping on the tuning key, which is more important to, to say than the tuning key is slipping in my experience bad restringing habits will cause your guitar to go out of tune way more than a tuner. Tuners get um, people, you know, right? You The operator blames the gear, right? Uh, too many times guitar players are like, this This tuning key is slipping. And a lot of times it's just the way they're restringing the guitar is not, not effective uh, comparatively. But uh, so although that's what causes guitars to go flat, uh, guitars going sharp is usually, like I said, the neck, uh, it pitches back and, and basically it stretches the string and goes sharp. So there you go. Um, the, I guess the answer, that's the answer to your question that uh, you didn't ask, but how do you fix that? Um, there's not a whole lot you can do. Some guitars will do it. Thicker necks tend to be more stable than thinner necks on average. I'd like to say woods chain, you know, matter, but, uh, it could be maybe a maple is more stable than a mahogany, but I mean, I hate to play that game because, you know, guitars are kind of, that's it's kind of the thing about guitars is 
they're kind of like pets. <laughs> There's no two of the same. You know, you can, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, you can get two pets that look identical, but their personalities are different. Things are different. The same thing. I know it sounds weird to compare an animal to a piece of wood hanging in the wall, but a guitar does have some kind of a personality and they do get the issue, you know, they get issues and they do well, you know, some do better than others. Um, so, you know, especially if all your guitars are doing it, um, you know, I don't know what to tell you. I'm trying to think of any suggestions that I have, but there's really not a lot. Like I said, I have guitars that just don't ever, when it comes to going sharp, going flat, there's all kinds of things you do. You can correctly cut the nut. You can, you know, like I said, change their restring, restringing habits. You can change the brand of strings. You can change your tuners. I mean, there's a ton of things you can do if your guitar is constantly going flat, but going sharp, the neck is moving. And essentially if you're controlling the environment, which is sounds like what you're doing, there's, there's not a whole lot more you can do besides that. Uh, oh, okay. So uh, this is from Drew says, I can't tell which one of Phil's single cuts are Gibson's and which are heritages due to the background cutting off the headstocks. Ah, well, the best way to tell, Drew, is the pick guards. The dead giveaway is the pick guards. In my opinion, the Heritage has the best pick guard. So this is the Gibson. I'm painting the, uh, pointing the gold top. Oh, you know what? I'm probably changing my camera view and get it closer. closer. Can I get a little closer? Look at that. This is the gold top. Yeah, new cameras, new year, new stuff. Look, I can move around. Okay, so gold top, Gibson, right? Heritage with the, uh, the pick guard that follows more of the line of the body. And then of course, that's a Gibson R9. So Gibson R9, there's a Heritage R150, uh, uh, H150. And this is a uh, this is a Gibson Les Paul Classic, um, but it will throw you off because I changed the pickups to chrome, and I put top hat knobs on it, and removed the classic uh, truss rod cover to make it look more like a standard. And the reason is is this thing is seven and a half pounds. <laughs> it's weight relieved, of course. Uh, I bought it from Carter's Vintage Guitars. Uh, was uh, I want to say into 2022. I was on Carter's Vintage Guitars, and one of the things I love about that uh, store, besides the magic of you can actually be in Nashville and go in there, but on their website, they get some of the coolest used gear coming through. I mean, uh, you know, you're not going to find that, you know, cool 299 find, but you're going to find some cool stuff in the thousand dollar up range that's really unique and cool but um they weigh their guitars which is nice and so all of a sudden i saw les paul classic gold top seven and a half pounds i was like oh yeah and uh, it's got a weird ne neck that's not quite the 60s thin and not quite the 50s it's right in the middle it's kind of very unique uh, neck um and then, uh, but it is weight relieved. So you guys know it is uh, the weight relieved uh, guitar. So I got that and then I bought that. And uh, what I do, I uh, uh, changed out the pick guard, I think. Um, I think because the pick guard was a little old, I changed out the pick guard. I changed out the poker chip, changed out the top hat knobs because I just like the way they look. And then I put uh, chrome covers on the uh, Gibson pickups. So there, there you go. Um, so there, there, there you go. Um, but if we're talking about new guitars, I actually got a new guitar. Uh, yep, I did it. I, um, uh, <laughs> I, I pulled a crazy trigger. I got a Gretsch. Uh, there it is. That's why it's uh, proudly standing there. It still has the piece of paper underneath the bridge. I haven't got that far, but, um, uh, that's, uh, I finally, I, I finally got the classic grid, uh, Gretsch. This is the 6120 Nashville. So it's uh, really cool. There will be a video. Um, I didn't buy it to do a video. I, it's not something I'm, I'm working with a company or anything. I just literally, I just felt like it was time, you know, to get that guitar. And, uh, and, uh, so I did it. <laughs> so I did it and I got it and, uh, I'm loving it. I got it from, uh, Eddie's guitars. Uh, so, you know, and, um, they gave me a smoking deal and, uh, I always a little nervous when I tell you guys that because I don't want anybody, you know, I want the dealers to give you a deal, but I don't want the dealers to get any headaches. Um, so, you know, they gave me, they gave me 15% off. I talked about this, but I didn't say who. So Eddie's Guitars, if you haven't checked them out, this is my second guitar buying a guitar from them. And um, I've always had a good experience with them online. They ship fast. They're really nice. I, I virtual talk to them. Um, they even, by the way, if anyone from Eddie's Guitars ever sees this, uh, thanks, man. Um, I just sent them an email saying, hey, um, I want to, I sent them a message saying, hey, if you're going to be running any sales i'd like to know because i'm interested in one of your guitars and they go actually we're still running our christmas sales 
we can give you a deal. And I said, okay, what's the deal? And I was hoping for 10% off. They went 15% off, which was great. But then they don't charge tax on the website. Um, uh, if you guys don't know how the tax rules work with sales tax, your website has to hit a certain dollar amount before you have to start collecting the sales tax. I'm not a tax person. So tax people, if you start putting information in there, I'm just going off what stores tell me what, why they do and some don't collect the sales tax. Um, uh, and I do remember the gear ex exchange for Sweetwater saying at first they didn't have to collect the sales tax, like I said, until they hit a certain volume. But anyways, 15% off plus the tax, that's like 25% off. They gave me a smoking deal, shipped it out immediately. And then when I got it, I got a little nice little card and it said, uh, we enjoy your show or I enjoy your show. And I go, oh, that's just, that's just cool, right? Um, so that was nice. So there you go. Um, uh, there's my cool, right? New, new Gretsch that we got to do a video about, right? Um, let's see. Uh, okay, this is a little bit longer one. It says, hey, Phil, hi, Phil. By the way, all the ones I'm reading so far are just off the Know Your Gear website that, you know, like I said, WW, these ones sent in. And we, it's nice I get to peruse them um, and pick them today. I always pick them the day of the show. I just quickly go through them and grab what I think is interesting. Uh, it says, hey, Phil, in the market for a real, I like it. it's real in quotes, real Gibson SG or Les Paul. I actually appreciate that. It's kind of funny. I'm like, uh, I like the irony of that. Real. What does that mean? Real. I know. We know what it means. It means expensive. <laughs> Why don't you just say expensive? I'm looking for a real. Why I like this, by the way, I want to, I'm, I'm not being sarcastic is I love that Gibson couldn't get the word authentic to stick in a positive way. I, I have nothing against Gibson. I'm a huge Gibson fan. I've given Gibson more money than any guitar company when you dollars. Like if I put on an Excel spreadsheet, trust me, Gibson has gotten more physical dollars out of my pocket than any single guitar company. And I'm not exaggerating uh, for personal. And uh, so obviously I'm a fan of the Gibson stuff, but I do kind of love that when they were out there doing the authentic video, it didn't work the way it, it you know, it was going to, you know, they wanted. Uh, obviously, um, <laughs> uh, obviously the word real, <laughs> he uses the word real instead of authentic, authentic. So didn't work. Okay. So it says, I really like Sweetwater's guitar gallery, but I wanted your thoughts on this. Why do I see so many Gibsons with obviously obvious aesthetic imperfections? Crooked tuners, scars in the fretboard, presumably from fret end filing, misaligned fretboards, etc. Um, not bashing, this is what he says, not bashing Gibson, just an observation. I personally feel that if I'm spending 2K or more, um, I add that part, uh, on a guitar, I want that type of thing done correctly. I get that it's an aesthetic, but it bothers me on principle. Okay, so... Here's my thoughts on that. Uh, I'll say it this way. If, if I'm not saying, you know, you're, you're being, you know, I'm saying if you're a picky guitar player about aesthetics, I don't know if a Gibson is the right guitar for you. <laughs> there's, there's, uh, you know, guitar companies, they, um, they ha all have a niche, but more importantly, you know, there's, a, uh, it's not said by Steve, I, but I just like that Steve, I said it, Steve, I said, whatever you focus on, that's what you get. Right. So if you focus on like why you're not a good guitar player, you're just going to not be a good guitar player. I'm paraphrasing what he said, but I just he was the person I heard him say it. This is years ago. He says, if you focus on, you know, being a good guitar player, you're going to be a good guitar player. <laughs> right. Like whatever you focus on, what you get. I think that's a great saying. And I think guitar companies are the same way. I think if you focus on quality control, if you focus on making your guitars perfect, I think you'll get perfect guitars or close to it. Right. Um, I, Gibson doesn't focus on that. You know, that's not, uh, 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 I think it's the thing that they focus on. In fact, I can tell you for a fact it's not. Um, there's so many things about the Gibson brand, but the, you know, the beautiful imperfections and, you know, fit and finish is not the thing they've ever been known for. No one's ever said, um, think about this. No one even slaps Gibson in the face with, man, back in the 60s, Gibsons were perfect, right? It's, they're, they're essentially hand-finished instruments. We can't say handmade because it's CNCs and stuff, but hand-finished instruments and there's imperfections. And there are instrument companies that are more focused on perfection if that's what you're focused on. Uh, for me, brands like uh, Brian just said, Framus, I would say Framus, I would say um, PRS. To be honest with you, 
any brand not doing a high volume is going to have less imperfections, right? Because volume is where the problem is, right? You're going to see more of it. It's it's like um, in the United States, the F-150 trucks, like the number one selling car, <laughs> truck car in, in the United States. And like, but if you read statistically, there's more of them in accidents, just number, not percentage uh, on the road. Well, the most of them are on the road. So same kind of logic. It's, you know, if a company makes a lot of guitars, you're going to see a lot more guitars with issues because uh, of the volume. So what I say, um, what I would say is, is I would not focus on that. Um, um, there is, I can tell you, I did a video, um, that, uh, a few, a few years back, um, it's actually, um, 2021, I want to say January, 2021, it might've been January, 2022, I'm trying to remember, but you can see it where I bought a Gibson RO, uh, for like $6,000. It was crazy money. It's just, I, I, you know, like I said, COVID sad you know, just depressed, uh, literally had COVID, <laughs> bought this guitar thinking, you know, I'm going to do it. I'm going to sell a bunch of guitars and get that one guitar. And it was full of flaws. And the guitar itself was probably fine. It's just like I said, for that kind of money, I just couldn't see it. You know, I couldn't see, you know, buying something with issues like that. Funny story about that is uh, recently I saw a comment on that video. Somebody's like, what did the store do that I bought it? What did they, how did they react? They, they basically, I sent it back. They sent me a full refund, which is nice because they, they could have hit restocking or they could have, you know, uh, you know, made me just turn, pay the return shipping. They gave me a full refund and then somebody bought it from them like it's had at a not discount because I'm pretty sure that, and this, I did talk to the store briefly and they told me that basically uh, they sent the information to Gibson and Gibson was like, you know, there's nothing Gibson was going to do. So that's my advice to you is basically, um, you know, you can try and kind of cherry pick out a really nice Gibson out of the bunch, but I would, my biggest concern telling you that even doing that is I think if that's something that's, that concerns you, like I said, for that kind of money, you think it should be better fit and finished. I think Gibson will, will be a disappointment for you as a whole. And that's coming from somebody who absolutely loves Gibsons for what, what I think matters about Gibsons. They have a vintage nostalgia. They have a sound. They have a vibe. Um, you know, there's a lot of things I love about a Gibson guitar, but it's not, you know, that the fact that they've mastered perfection of stuff, I think. Um, sadly enough, I think now, you know, some of the Indonesian guitars that you can buy are so fit and finished so perfectly, they they put everything to shame. Um, so there, there's whatever. So, so per perfection isn't a cost. <laughs> you can buy a guitar that I think is almost absolutely perfect for six, $700. And I'm rounding up a little bit. Um, so, uh, that's, that's my advice to you. Maybe not focus on that. Um, that, that brand. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, Hey Phil, a uh, happy holidays. Um, he probably sent this email during the holidays. Uh, he says I recently came across tone, right? Um, and I haven't seen any videos from you about this product. It claims to aid your guitar by vibrating the strings to mimic naturally playing. Um, let's go ahead and show you guys what this is. Um, this, I'm aware of this product, this particular product because uh, they were doing a lot of sponsored Instagram uh, feeds. So of course, anytime I popped on Instagram, I was getting, you know, tone right in my face. Um, it looks like it's available at Sweetwater. No, not Sweetwater, Stumac. Stumac, let me show you this. Thing if I can, let me get rid of that. Let me get rid of that. Can I move this? There you go. Hope you guys can all see. It. Tone right for guitar, for guitar, domestic. Okay, so what what is this thing? Um, it's a vibrator for your guitar. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing, guys. I'm gonna come on. I try to keep a PG, but I mean it's a vibrator for your guitar. I mean it's a hard thing to get around. Okay, so uh, so basically what they do is they sell this device for $150 or $170 if you don't live in the United States. Um, and uh, basically you stick this on your guitar and it vibrates your guitar. And uh, it's uh, and why, you ask? I'm sure some of you are like, why? Why would you want to do that? What is the sound? It's not a sound. Um, so it actually comes from, more importantly, a thing that really does happen. So we talked about last week, I have Monty Montgomery is my favorite guitar player and he plays a Yuri, which is a Japanese-made Alvarez. Um, 
Fantastic guitar. Uh, there's a amazing factory tour of Yuri. It's now a little dated now, but you can watch it on YouTube. And on there, they show the the uh, luthiers basically hand kind of uh, sculpting the necks and stuff. But in there, they were one of the first companies I ever saw do this. Uh, 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 but many companies do it. What they do is they build the guitar, and after they're done with the acoustic, it's all built. They put them in a room in in a row in like racks, and then they play loud music in the room, like big. 18 inch subwoofers, right? Loud music. Um, I think they play loud classical music. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not kidding. Um, they play loud music. And the reason they do this is for two reasons. The first one is probably the most important reason, which is the sound. If you've ever been in a guitar center and somebody hits a really loud chord on one of those electric guitars and all the guitars ring, <laughs> if you haven't experienced this, this is a kind of fun experience. They, um, the guitars reverberate and the strings ring because of the vibrations. Um, the um, basically what they're doing is they're causing the guitars to to vibrate like they would if they were being played. Because whether you're strumming or the music's causing the strings to move, the strings are vibrating. I shouldn't say vibrating. Strings are moving, and then therefore the guitar is moving, the top is moving, and so obviously being recently built, this is kind of like what you see when you see somebody take a weight and drop it on a chair a thousand times to see how, how well the cushion holds up. This is to see, um, to see how, you know, if there's anything that's going to fall off, right. You know, is any of the glue going to come loose? Is anything crack? Does one of the braces fall off, right? It's a good way to check things on the guitar. So they do it for that reason. The second reason is, is that, um, obviously, um, much like a lot of things, uh, there's there's a lot of theories out there, and it's, uh, like speakers have this theory as well too. Like the longer it's played, the more it's broken in. Acoustics, I think, are um, again, you know, whether you believe it or not, I believe that um, uh, that the um, the the longer a guitar is played, acoustic guitar, especially especially acoustic guitar, the more it has kind of a broken in feel to it, and maybe even a softer, more broken in sound. Um, and, uh, and so I think, um, I think that's the logic behind this thing. Now that, that being said, I, I really don't understand the device. <laughs> I'm just explaining what it does would. So I guess I'm thinking that the end user customer is someone who buys a acoustic guitar, especially a high-end acoustic guitar with a solid top. They stick this vibrating device on it. And, and I apologize if it's not actually vibrating, it's doing something else, but it is causing the, the guitar strings to, re, re, you know, move. And, um, you know, set it down and essentially you can break in your guitar without playing it. It makes me sad first. I'm going to tell you the sad thing because it's kind of the realization that, you know, like, well, why wouldn't you just play your guitar? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know. It's one of those things, I guess I would put in a category. I wouldn't shun anyone who bought it. If some of you bought it and said it worked and you loved it, I wouldn't have a, uh, a stern opposing opinion to you. Would I buy it? No. Um, uh, would I test it if they reached out to me and said, Hey, we want you to stick it on a guitar and try a guitar a month later after whatever you run this thing. Would I do it? I don't even think I'd do it. Here's why I don't think I would do it. There's a part of me, um, that there's a part of me that would be curious, you know, to know if it worked or if I, I can notice a difference, but there's also another part of me is like, you know, even if it worked, <laughs> even if the, it proved to me after 30 days, the guitar sounded better, whatever that means, I wouldn't spend 150 bucks for it. I just play a guitar really hard for the month. <laughs> so, uh, and I would say, I would also say that if I need a, a thing to do that, I would also maybe not have as many guitars. There's a reason why I have more electrics than acoustics. Um, I have a few acoustics and the ones I have, I truly am passionate about because of that reason. I like to play my acoustics all the time. I don't like my acoustics to sit dormant. Electric guitar sometimes like, you know, it's, it's you pick it up and play it every once in a while. It's kind of nice to have it. It's beautiful guitar, but I don't really need a bunch of acoustics. So that's just my two cents on it. But again, like I said, if you said you loved it, I'd, I, I wouldn't tell you like, oh, you're snake oil, you fell for it. Um, you know, I just don't know. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to give you strong opinions about whether it works or not works, but I would be, I would be remiss if I didn't say that my gut says that 50%, I'm being very nice of those people with those opinions are pulling it out of their ass and they don't really don't know either way, right? You know, whether they're saying it works or doesn't work. I bet you most people just don't know. 
So, because I don't truly know. I just know the theory behind it and why some companies have done it. And, um, but I'm not here to say, you know, like they, you know, but I, I, I'm not in the market for one and that's um, why. <laughs> but I like those things to talk about. And I don't have an opinion of, uh, you know, all gimmick, you know, products like this are gimmicks. So I don't know. Like I said, I just don't have, I don't, I don't have it in my head to buy one. Um, uh, Pop says, Tone right. I didn't believe it until I spent some time with a Canadian folk star, Rick Bar Barron. Uh, he bought it. He bought a pair of Koa tailors and it works. See, like I said, that's what I'm saying. Either way, I would totally understand. Like if you said it totally works and if somebody said it didn't work, I'd be like, yeah, you know, again, uh, it's, uh, it's not something I would be interested in, but again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue. Uh, so pops, I don't argue with you 1%. If you say you heard it and you, you believe it works, I believe that it, you believe it works. <laughs> what I mean by that, I'm not being sarcastic. I'm being truthful and saying I have no real, uh, yeah, the, um, so, you know what it reminds me of? Uh, it's funny. Scott Crove just said, it sounds like one of those five minute abs type of things. You know, Scott, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of, does anyone remember uh, anyone, any old Bruce Lee fans here? Uh, didn't he do the thing where he put the electrodes to us and, and like it caused, it causes muscles to work out. You know, it's one of those things like you hear those stories and you're like, I don't know, does that work? Does should I electrocute my muscles to make them stronger or, or is it craziness? So, all right. All right. Uh, and I wish that company the best of luck, by the way. Uh, like I said, maybe they figured out the the, the, the magic or maybe they haven't. Um, okay, uh, this is a good subject. I really like this. Uh, this came from the Panda. The Panda says, uh, what uh, premium is paid to use Indian Rosewood versus Indian Laurel in guitar manufacturing? I love questions like this. And why is PRS using Indian Rosewood on SEs while Fender and Gibson are using Indian Laurel on Squires and Epiphones? And this, this is a great question because I think at the core, there's always, especially with so much great gear out there, you know, it's never a question like, is this any good? It's always a question is like, why is this? Why is this more? Why is this less? Why is this, there's less of these? Why are there more of these? This is a great question, whether you realize or not the Panda, because if the question was, why does Indian, you know, why does a guitar with Indian Rosewood cost more than Indian Laurel? That's a conversation, but this is the more core, your core, your, your question is, why is there a premium? What is going on here? And the thing about the guitar industry that's really important to focus on, and it's not unique to the guitar industry, but we only talk about the guitar industry on this channel, is that there's two, two reasons why manufacturers make the decisions they do about prices for us, the guitar player and consumers. Um, one is, I want to say it's more physical and factual. Okay. It's, it's tangible. Okay, they buy a piece of wood and that wood is expensive and therefore the premium is passed on to the consumer. Okay, so um, a perfect example, right, is if you told me, especially back in the day, like a piece of rosewood, they charge more for rosewood than they did for maple. Maybe that's a thing, right? Um, so so in this case, you know, one company says that rosewood's a premium uh, and one company says it's not a premium because they're putting it on their less premium price guitars. So there's the, there's a real cost of the premium. And then there is a perception cost or comparable cost that they have to, to pay attention to. And we've talked about this on the show many times, which is there's more than just the cost in what a guitar is. There's a comparable. And what I mean by that is, it, and it's so easy to see once I tell you, you know, you're going to see it everywhere. When you see a company that only does one thing, Notice how the pricing makes a lot more sense, especially if you walk it back. What I mean by that is if you see a company only making like, and we'll stick to U.S. guitars because it's easier that way. You have a company that makes only U.S. guitars. Everything they do makes sense because they're only making one guitar, one type of guitar. Okay. USA made guitars, which are probably going to be a premium priced instrument for whatever reasons they're premium priced. Let's say then you have another company. They only make a, guitars made out of Asia. 
And again, the logic seems to make a lot of sense with their guitars. What I mean by that is take two, take one brand that only makes guitars, let's say made in Indonesia, we'll keep it easy, okay? And they make a guitar in Indonesia and this one has like a basswood body and a maple neck. And then this next model has like a mahogany body with a maple cap and a um, mahogany neck with rosewood. And the price will go up ever so much, right? Slightly, whatever, but it goes up. Because to them, they're taking the real cost that the mahogany and the maple cost versus the basswood, and they're passing that on to the consumer. They, we have to pay that real cost. But notice how it can get a little confusing once a company makes a guitar in, let's say, Indonesia and the US, because it's not about what it actually costs anymore, it's what it compares to. When I've told you guys this before. If you um, if you have a guitar that's $4,000 made in the USA and you're making a version of that in overseas in Asia, that guitar can't be like a nickel that, that throws everybody's minds off. If it basically, think about this. I want to, uh, this is a fair question to ask, just ask yourself in your head right now. If I told you that a Paul Reed Smith Core Custom 24 is $4,000, because that's what they are now, so you know, they're $4,000 US. But the SE were the same prices as the basically the cust the PRS looking Harley Benton, which is two ninety nine. So if I told you you can buy a custom twenty four SE made for two ninety nine, but the US one's four thousand dollars, you'd be like, that's insane. E even people buying would only buy people who only would buy the USA one would be like, why is one three hundred dollars once four hundred dollars? I mean, it's not even four hundred dollars to four thousand dollars. I think I said that wrong, but you get the idea. It's $300 to $4,000. The fact that they can sell the Indonesian one for $1,000, you start you start going, oh, that feels closer. <laughs> you know, And then you start justifying in your head why the prices are different. But I've told you a lot of times the price and the import is really just because of how much the US version is. That's just how it works. That's just, it's just logical that way. So, um, and so PRS is basically, they are building a guitar and they're not really function. They're not worried about, um, like a 299, uh, uh, you know, affordable guitar. They're, their are affordable SEs are essentially premium. In my opinion, SE guitars, I mean, cheap ones are 700 bucks. I don't consider that an affordable instrument, even in today's market. Um, that's, that's still a premium priced instrument. Um, it's not like a $2,000 guitar, but it's still premium priced. So, so what I'm basically saying is it's more than just what it physically costs them. It is what the comparable cost is. So that's why they sometimes will make those decisions. Uh, Epiphone and Squire, my guess is they probably want to standardize most of their lines. So they keep uh, the Indian Laurel for the guitars that are $2.99 and then just keep on the guitars that are $7.99. It probably makes things easier, especially when you're building mass amounts of guitars. Once you build mass amounts of guitars, it's all about mass amounts of parts. And um, if you've ever manufactured guitars, let me tell you one of the problems is, is parts become really problematic because they become a holding pattern of your instruments. Um, you know, um, uh, I was talking to a viewer today or, uh, dealing with a viewer today that, um, bought a Kiesel and, uh, they're the second one to send me this message that they got a Kiesel, but they didn't get their tremolo arm and they got a wee -O from Kiesel because Kiesel didn't have the trim arms. So they're just shipping out the guitars without the tremolo arm. And then they're going to send them, I guess, the tremolo arm. And, um, and, um, I mean, I get it, right? Because it's a Godo uh, part and Godo parts take so long to get so they can hold up your instruments. So a lot of times manufacturers will try to buy in bulk to not only buy their prices down with parts or woods, not only to buy the price down, but also to have the volume so they can just keep making stuff. So in this case, I think that's the case why Squire and Epiphones are using one type of woods and PRS SEs are using another one is because PRS is doing this comparable, like we want to make, we want these guitars to be a certain price because we want them to compare to these very expensive ones and we want this, you know, this premium uh, to make sense, right? I hope that kind of makes sense. I can go into more detail if it doesn't. But that is really the, the real reason why they all tend to do the things they do. It's, uh, it's tough, like I said. It's why I tell you that ultimately um, when you support, and, I, and I, don't, I don't mean this to be negative, but it's, it's just important to understand this. When you support a company 
that if you're trying to support a company that's made in USA and they make import guitars, understand that you have no control of where your money goes. It still goes. It's so like somebody was like, I'll never buy an Epiphone and support China. I'm only going to buy Gibsons. I'm like, literally Gibson profits go to Epiphone guitars to build more Epiphone guitars. Literally, you're supporting Epiphone. Um, I mean, it's obvious that these companies are connected, right? Fender and Squire are the same company. Epiphone and Gibson the same choir. It, it's a company. So if you really want your money to not go overseas, if that's a thing for you, and again, we don't want to be political on the channel because they just don't, that stuff bores the crap out of me. But, you know, there's small builders, right, that you can focus on that, you know, there's, there's other things you can do, but don't ever you know, kind of trick yourself. Uh, there was a comment the other day on one of my videos and the, and, the, and, and, the, and the guy was saying that basically he wouldn't buy any import instruments, only U.S. guitars, but yet, he, and just, I don't want to say it because I don't want you to see who it is because uh, I don't want you to give him crap. Um, but he la la labeled off a bunch of his USA guitars and literally I, I can tell you for a fact, three of the USA guitars he listed, they use import parts on those USA guitars. So he was supporting the thing he's apparently against because he was uninformed. So, uh, unfreaking believable says Phil, can you share your signal chain for recording your upcoming demos and background track background tracks uh, tracks? Yes. Uh, so um, we we didn't we were going to do it and then we uh, revised everything. So obviously new lighting in the room. You can see all the guitars clearly now, right? <laughs> uh, so we have new lighting. And of course, because I messed up the beginning of the show, you can see I'm still using the mixers and stuff um, and uh, new cameras. The other studio, which is where I do the YouTube videos, has new cameras and new lighting and new stuff. And so, yes, I'm going to be sharing that guys with you this year. But um, I wanted to you know, make sure not only that I had the new stuff, but I wanted to be make sure it, I, I, I like it and I'm keeping it. So, um, but yes, I'll do a video on that. And the, also the recording chain and how we do it, especially now that we do everything in two rooms, it's a little more tricky. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So watch this. Eddie, Eddie, Eddie's Eddie, I guess it's Eddie G world says reference are onto something good with stock features like Karina locking tunes, et cetera. So Eddie perfectly you're what you're pointing out is exactly what I'm talking about. Um, Reverend guitars are all made. Um, I think in Korea, right? They make them at the mirror factory. I don't know if they do any Indonesian guitars as well. They might, but all the ones I've seen have come out of mirror, which is in Korea. And, Reverend guitar is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Notice how their logic makes sense. I mean, their guitars are definitely not inexpensive. They're expensive instruments, but they're quality. Obviously, if you get Fishman pickups, the price goes up. Like you said, if you get Karina versus, you know, uh, you know, if they're using basswood or whatever, because they don't really have any other agenda to to sell you as an as the oh, well, this is the, you know, USA made Reverend and this is the main China Reverend and this is made in Korea Reverend and these are how we're going to price all this stuff. It's really just they're using one place and they're building all the guitars. So therefore the pricing structure is really kind of mostly affected by the tangibles. You know, a more expensive bridge means the guitar price goes up. More expensive wood, the price goes up. More expensive pickups, the price goes up. It gets, like I said, it can get confusing with uh, when they make multiple, when they use multiple different factories in different places of the world, you can note and different branding, like having sub branding and premium branding. Like I said, the logic always sometimes doesn't line up and you're like, why doesn't this make sense? And like I said, it's because the price is not always dictated by just the components, but it's also the comparable of the other things they're trying to sell you because they got to make all of this make sense in the stepping process. Why do you step to the next thing? And, um, you know, if you've, uh, you guys know, obviously, cause I had the store for 13 years. One of the things you're, you're trained at, I still have the training manuals. I don't think they make them anymore, <laughs> but Fender has training manuals on how to sell Fender products. And a lot of companies would have these training manuals and they would train you just like they train their sales reps. And one of the things they would train you is not only about the product, which I, I loved, but they would trade you, I train you on how to step people up <laughs> just like a car dealership. What well, leather seats, <laughs> GPS, right? Uh, it's not only just tell you those options. Cause that doesn't mean anything. If somebody, if you, you went to a guitar store and they just said, these are options or more, they taught you how to like explain to the customer, the logic of the stepping process. Um, and, uh, that's a lot of thought is putting to convincing us that these things have you know, the value points. Um, 
Yeah, uh, Nella says U.S. made. I did a review of the U.S. made uh, Reverend. He says they were made a similar de de electro. Yes, um, I'm just kind of stuttering that through. I apologize, Nella. Uh, yes, the Reverends, when they were made in the USA, the ones I've played, and of course the one I, I bought and did a video of, uh, was made of the same material as a Dane Electro, which is why I don't know why I can't think of that stuff. I always think it's the stuff that they used to ba on the back of TVs. That's how old I am when the TVs are. Uh, and it's always got a weird name. And it escapes me, but it's essentially cardboard. <laughs> what, what is it called? Uh, somebody will say it in the comments. What's this stuff called? It's like a fiber board. And it's got a funny... Ah, Masonite. Thank you, Leland. Masonite. <laughs> I just remember, like, I was like... I just remember I had a weird name. Masonite. Uh, yeah, so they're made of Masonite, which is... Uh, and, or MDF. It's, yeah. Um, it's just, All I remember is I just remember the back of the TV set... Oh, Jesus. Because uh, I'm, I'm 740 years old. I don't know if you guys know that. And so uh, for those of you younger viewers uh, that are um, not only did the back of the TVs have Masonite, which is like this cardboard, you had screws and you had to take it out to change the tubes. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, here's the good news. I can say this. I am old enough to remember that, but I'm young enough to where I never changed the tubes in my own TV. I got to watch my parents do it because I wasn't allowed to touch it because I was still young enough to not uh, be allowed to touch the tubes in your TV. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, let's do... I'm gonna, I still have some early questions and I still have some email questions. Let me grab a couple super chats so they don't stack up. Um, since I seem like I feel like I'm a little all over the place today, as I am all the time. I think the whole show is chaos all the time. That's the that's the magic of the show. It's the chaos show. Um, we have a question from, or a subject from, Antique Rocker. Antique Rocker says, what is your opinion on the Parker P42? There's one for sale for $850 near me where I live. Is it worth checking out? So the Parker P42, and I'm going I'm to show everybody what that is so you guys know I'm a huge Parker fan. The P42 is a import version of the Parker. It's a maple neck, and it's a, uh, let me see if I can just grab one. I'm just going to grab an image for, well, you know what we can do? Let's see if there's one on reverb. And uh, that's not coming up. Okay, let's just grab an image. Uh, all right, so here is a P42. Let's go to the web. And so you can see it has the Parker vibe, as you can see one right here. Um, but it's a bolt-on neck. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it doesn't have the carbon fiber, you know, stuff. It's not that. Um, they're really cool. My problem is, you know, I, I remember when they were that much new. Uh, so it's like, it's just crazy that they're that much used. Um, it's a cool guitar. But in my mind, it's Parker looking. And it has a, a nice shaped Parker neck, which is a C-carve. But to me, the Antique Rocker, my only apprehension to you is, I bet if you got it, and you might you might agree with what I'm about to tell you, um, it's not going to feel any different than any other guitar other than the shape, you know, um, some people will say the horn will stab you in the chest. The USA ones do because they kind of arc, they, they kind of angle back, but these don't so much. It's really just whether or not you want one or not. Um, but like I said, it's not, it's not the same as the Parker USA guitars. So I almost say for 850 bucks, man, I feel like there's a lot of better guitars out there unless you're just a huge Parker fan. Cause you know, with that headstock, you can't hang on a, on a, on a hanging stand. It's not ultra light, which is one of the appeals to me with Parker guitars, where you can get a Parker guitar that's like four or five pounds. It's, um, like I said, it's is it worth checking out? I don't know. Like I said, I, I think I think you'd pick it up and find it probably doesn't feel much different than a made Mexico Strat, and it, other than the shape, that's just my my thoughts on that. Um, one thing that's great, let me share this with you. I told you guys last week when you guys asked me for advice. Uh, that, you know, it's nice to get feedback how it worked out. If you guys remember last week, uh, Pete, one of the viewers, uh, asked me, told me that he had a problem with a, a Fender style guitar. He had put noiseless, Fender noiseless generation fourth, fourth generation pickups in it. And he's got the pickup as low as he can. And the string is still touching the top of the pickup. And that, you know, is he going to have to route the cavity? What's he going to do? And my advice to him 
was to shim the neck. And I said, you can get a shim, a professional shim, you know, off the internet, or you can make one or what have you, but shim the neck up, that'll fix your problem. And then figure out from there, you know, uh, if you want to keep the guitar or use the pickups, if you like them. Um, I think it was like an hour after the show. I wasn't even finished indexing the show. He sent me pictures. And so he did exactly what I said. He put a shim there. He made a quick shim, stuck it in there, as you can see. Uh, and I think he did the shim with the actual, yep, the paper from the box, I think, or something like that is what he was saying. And so he's put, I probably look like a two pieces right there. He said it worked like a charm. I think there's a picture where, nope, there it is. And yeah, so the string is not, see, far enough now from the pickup, solved this problem. So I thought that was cool because I, I, I asked you guys if you would do that whenever I give you technical information like that, or if I give you some advice, if you, you don't have to super chat me again or try to get it on here, just send it. That's what he did. He sent it to the website. I will search and pick for that kind of stuff because I think that's a, a cool thing to share with you guys is, you know, um, you know, if it worked or if it failed again, you know, I, I, you know, and I'll make as many mistakes as I do right things too. So, um, so there you go. Uh, but, uh, so thank you, Pete, for sending that to me and, uh, updating everybody. I thought that was really cool. And, uh, and also I think these are the more illustrative things, not to say like, haha, I said shim and he did. And what was right. It's now he shoved cardboard in there. He solved the problem. Like I said, sometimes I, I think what's great about this kind of platform than actual official videos is, you know, it's kind of like us talking like a bunch of friends, you know, hanging out, talking on a Friday afternoon about the thing we love guitars. And, and when somebody's like, yeah, I have this problem. Somebody's like, yeah, just do this. You know, it's, it's not, it doesn't need a. You know, it's not an hour discussion of the problem. Just as simple as shove a piece of cardboard in there. I think I actually said business cards last week. So he used the packaging. So there you go. Perfect. Um, okay. Uh, uh, origin, origin of Origin of Life Lab Failures. It's a long name, but I, I dig it. Someone on YouTube said noiseless pickup circuit boards break. That's me. <laughs> I don't know if you meant that's me, but it is me. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, noiseless uh, fenders circuit board boards break a lot. So you have to be very delicate with them when you crack them all the time. It's uh, it's one of the things I wish they would kind of fix it, uh, address it, maybe, you know, change it. Um, okay. So and, and I just thought I'd share that with you. Okay. Um, Jay Martinez. I just received an Ingle Founders Edition because Jay Martinez has a lot of money, everybody. <laughs> That's a great amp. That's like, isn't it like 3,800 bucks? I think it's uh, incredible tones. I, I would imagine I'm a huge Ingle fan, even though apparently I can't say Ingle. And I'm never going to say it other than the way I say it now. Uh, have you tried it? I have not tried it, man. I don't have the, I don't, I don't know. Uh, it says, ha, uh, I have the Iron Ball 20. That's a great amp. The Fireball 25. That's one of my favorite amps. And uh, this is a plan to keep all three. Yeah, it's great amp. I mean, woo, yeah. Um, Ingle and I have a, a good relationship. Obviously, they, they sent an Iron Ball once and they sent a, a Fireball 25. And, um, and uh, you know, but I don't think they... Uh, I think, and I, I don't know. So I, again, I would never uh, presume to, you know, to pigeonhole Ingle in this, but I, I feel like sometimes Ingle is one of those companies and there's a few others that I can name, but I'm not gonna, cause it's not relevant to this question where they sell, um, you know, some really nice amps that I would probably be super interested in checking out and doing videos about and maybe then buying, right? Uh, but a lot of times uh, companies like that really focus on the gent style YouTube channels and like just selling the metal. Um, you know, the Ingle Wall Fireball 25 to me is one of the most versatile amps on the market. It's one, you know, it's one of the amps I could say, if you told me, Phil, you can only have, you know, one amp. I, I'm not saying that's the amp I would pick, but I would, I could, I would whittle it right now to five and it would be in the five. And then I'd have to compare at the moment and kind of figure out, but I love that amp. I feel like I can get everything from fender tones to, 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 to metal, to, to rock, to blues. I, I just love the amp, but I know Engel and a lot of companies like Engel, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, Bogner, right. You name it, uh, Saldano, they really focus on just, uh, you know, 
demoing the metal sounds to you guys. Um, even Laney, you know, they're very metal oriented and kind of slanted that way. And maybe that's what Schechter, remember I said Schechter used to send the guitars and they don't anymore. Maybe because that's the same thing there. They really want to push the metal avenue and the channel is really not known for metal uh, as much. And so maybe that's why they don't do it. But I, and I probably have made that uh, worse for myself because here's what's funny about this. Um, I play a lot of metal. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and it's funny though, but when I do videos, I tend to never do metal very much, even if it's a metal styled amp, because so many channels did the metal side that I kind of wanted to hit. I want to hit that, the viewer who's not, you know, uh, so like when I did the Ingle, um, what was the one? Oh, when I did the Seldano amp, there's a comment recently I saw that was kind of made me laugh. The guy said, uh, basically didn't like my video because he's like, why would you even care or show the clean channel on this amp? And I'm like, because no one else did. <laughs> That's why I did it. <laughs> but yeah, now I play the metal so uh, sound on that amp too, but I was trying to, to focus on that. So, um, but, uh, uh, but I love, uh, I, I love the Ingle stuff, man. I think they're, uh, fantastic, fantastic amps. So, uh, and that one, especially cause it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a uh, uber expensive and really cool. So that's my two cents on that. Um, and, uh, uh, okay. So Randy Crook says, Hey Phil, I just got an Ibanez Q 52 headless guitar. I'm extremely pleased with it. Have you tried one? And if so, your thoughts, I have not, I have not played any Ibanez headless guitars um at all in any way ibanez i'm a huge ibanez fan uh and uh but it's one of the guitars that just hasn't been uh like on my radar i'm going to share it with you right now so you guys know let me just go here so we can all see what it looks like ah oh, it looks like that um this guitar is i mean it looks cool i actually like the shape i love the vibe i love the look i love that they put a little a nub there on the headstock so i think you can actually hang it on a, ha on a hanger and I think this guitar is about a thousand bucks. Um, so uh, cool guitar, not on my radar for any particular reason other than for headless guitars. Um, I mean, now it's getting tough, okay, now. But that guitar is a thousand dollars. It was a thousand dollars two, three years ago. And I could get a, he a Kiesel headless for about 15 new. Now they're getting closer to thousand dollars. So now that guitar looks more you know, kind of appealing. But so, you know, what I bought for a headless instead of that, when that came out was I bought a used Kiesel Vader, which was neck through. And um, that's why I did that. Uh, no particular reasons. There's no like Kiesel's better than I've been as I've been, I've been as better than Kiesel. It was more of like a, hey, you know, it's just, I was more familiar with those, those guitars. Um, so haven't tried it, but um, ah, there you go. Uh, but thanks for the feedback on that. It's like, cool. I'm glad, happy new guitar day and I'm glad you dig it. Um, Ray, uh, Ray, Ray Sewell says, what happened to Ron Thorne? Uh, so if you guys don't know, Ron Thorne uh, was a, the principal master builder at Fender Custom Shop. That's his weird title. He had a weird title. That's like that title didn't exist before him and I don't think it's existed for uh, since him. As far as I know, Ron has not been at Fender since like midpoint last year. And I thought he brought back Thorn guitars, his brand of guitars. Um, um, I know very little to nothing other than, uh, other than um, that for a while he was working out of his house, even for Fender. Um, I remember talking to a friend who's, you know, obviously knows the industry too. And we were talking and I, uh, he came up and I said, Oh, is he, he's, is he still building for Fender? And they said, yeah, he's building Fender, but at home. So I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> and then, uh, it wasn't much after that. I saw something, uh, you know, on the internet, uh, a, a blip of something saying that he's back to building his own guitars. So that's what I know. I know very little about that. Uh, why he, you know, if he's not, as far as I know, he's not building for Fender, but, uh, I kind of feel like, uh, apprehensive to say anything because he might still be building for Fender. I don't know a hundred percent. I just saw that somebody said he's building his own guitars again. Um, so there you go. Uh, Rexy lab. Hey, look, and I say it right. No relaxy lab. I don't know why I always saw relaxy. I mean, once he, once you said it's Rexy Lab, I was like, yeah, why do I see Relaxy? 
<laughs> so Rexy Lab says, I sent you an email to review a product and haven't heard back. Yeah, that's there's no way. If you send an email, uh, especially, um, uh, let's see. Hold on, I'll, I'll explain in a second why in a second. Um, it's door, D I think D-O-R, it's door, the auto latch adapter, Kaler International T4 Floyd Rose, similar bridges, anything I can do to help the process. Um, so... Rexy, why don't I do this? Why don't I, uh, I'll help you uh, by helping everybody. So here's the dealio. Where, let's go. Like, a, so I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna try and show you. Okay, I'm gonna use a quick little filter here. I don't know if I can preview this. All right. Uh, okay, I'm going to, Eddie, I'm going to screen grab this because obviously I don't want to show everybody your email address, but I'm going to show you why you didn't get through. <laughs> so, and it's going to help you in other companies, but so you know, it's not something I want to do. Not, not so much not help you. I don't really want to help the other companies, but... I'm going to show you, hold on, let me get out of this first and get out of this. Okay. Uh, Rexy lab, Eddie, this is what your email looks like. Um, so how I found it right now is I typed in, uh, and it filtered right up and I found it cause I'm looking for it. Ready? Here we go. This is what it looks like. So let's do that. Does that move? Why doesn't it move? Huh? Um, so, oh, because it screen grabs that way. I want to make sure I go this way. Hold on a second. So it grabs it no matter what. See, I was trying not to do that. Um, but you saw that says where it says, be careful with this message is what I was trying to show you, right? Um, so what happens when you send us emails, we get thousands and th this is nothing we do. I don't have any filters, okay? I don't have any Gmail filters of any kind. But when you get thousands of emails a month. We get thousands. It's not, a, I wish I was exaggerating. I'm not. Um, it could be tens of thousands. Um, Gmail, you gotta understand that, that volume of email, um, they assume everything is, they see how they spammed it. They just said this is like, could be phishing or whatever. So, um, so basically long story short, they basically, that's what happens. So I don't see a lot of that stuff. So the question is, how do you get it through? Um, I don't know. This is what happens. We go through all these emails, but I mean, even then we're just filtering to see, you know, like a lot of the ask ones come in, they come in specials because they say ask. So they say ask. So we see that and then we go, okay, is there questions there and read that, but we can only get to a percentage of them. I just can't help it. And I've told you guys this in the past before is that my channel isn't like a huge channel. It's just not a small channel. And so if I have a viral video, I will get thousands of emails in a period of days. And then, you know, if I don't have any viral videos, if I'm just doing like my video gets 20,000 views or whatever, and everything's normal again, I get like, you know, 20 emails, like a normal person. But, and then I have time to check those emails. That's why some people go, wow, I can't believe you answered my email in five minutes. I'm like, well, today there was like six emails and I answered yours and I went through them and that's how easy it was. And then some days some people are like, hey, you've never responded to me. I'm like, yeah, it's because I got 6,000 emails in, in 72 hours and literally other than filtering through looking for things, that's all we did. Um, so, uh, so how do I help you? Um, uh, Rexy lab, this is how I help you. Um, uh, MGC lessons, uh, at gmail.com is the official way to get, uh, that's how company companies get a hold of us. Um, if you're anyone else, I can tell you right now, if you send anything to that email, that's not an actual business request, it's going to get deleted. Uh, it doesn't go to me, but it's how you get that stuff to me. Um, I try to spend more time. Uh, I did this a few years back. I try to spend my time not do, when I'm not doing content, when I'm on the, my computer, I try to spend my time with my patrons and the channel members answering their, and that's already dozens and dozens a day. I try to do that. And then I try to handle all the asks, I try to, I actually try to interact with you guys right now, the people I'm interacting with right now. That's what I do. I, and I, I've worked very, very hard, um, to get to a level where I can do that. So I don't actually try to, I don't talk to companies. In fact, if I'm talking to a company, it's just because, you know, 
uh, sometimes companies just don't understand that I don't want to talk to the company. <laughs> so if it's a product or a video and stuff, it's all filtered through other people now. So, and that's the way it works. And so, you know, I, um, like I was talking about, you know, earlier on the show with Tim Pierce, um, you know, promoting his lesson program, which again, you know, if you guys want to check it out, uh, down below, check it out. Um, Tim and I, that's how we became friends. Um, we met at a PRS event and we've been friends ever since. And when we talk on the phone, we talk about this. And that's one of the things he taught me. He said, Phil, one day he's like, you know, you gotta, you gotta not do, you can't do everything. And I'm like, I know. And he, I go, how do you do it? And he goes, basically he compartmentalizes it and he has somebody handle the business side of it because that really doesn't need me. You know, a business, the business, if somebody wants, um, a, a video, they want a video. And I don't mean you specifically, Eddie. I know we have had personal conversations and I know you personally, Eddie, but you, but, but I'm just saying, if you're saying like, how do I get a product on a, on a video? To me, that's a business question and anybody can handle that. I don't want to say anybody, but, um, but like nobody can, I don't want people coming up to me going, Hey, Phil, this person wants to know what's your favorite Gretsch. I'm like, well, that's something no one else can answer but me. So I'll, I tend to stay uh, that way and it's been working. So you can send it to that email. I hope that helps. Um, now that I have it, I'll, I have to push a little thing on Gmail to tell it that this isn't, you know, spam or phishing. It's, see, notice it's spam, not even phishing or no, it said phishing. We you get the idea. Um, but that's what happens. So, you know, it's, it's uh, the thing that's why people always tell us we're filtering things. And I'm like, we're not filtering anything. <laughs> Uh, they, uh, uh, other than I can tell you right now, the heavy filtering, which seems to be better now on YouTube was definitely because we were getting all those scams. Remember the scams, the online scams are always trying to tell you that, Hey, I'm Phil McKnight and send me 50 bucks and I'll, I'm going to send you a prize. Um, so we had to use filtered, uh, filters for that to reduce that and it, and it has worked. Uh, and so it's calmed down, but you understand we had to filter so many strange things, um, one of the th words that we filtered, uh, which now is we're safe again, so we can release it. So I, I just uh, was the word me, M E, because everything was like message me on WhatsApp, email me here, call me. So we figured out if we use the word me, it, everything had to get approved that said me. Well, how many of you guys are saying, you know, me and my friend bought a guitar last week, and you're like, why are you blocking my 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 comment? I'm like, well, I'm not blocking it. We, we just, we had to come up with words that would filter out the scam artists. And so that's how we were doing it. We were filtering out parts of their conversation. Then, so, you know, they got so crazy that they started just typing in emojis. Here's a flag for you guys. If you ever get a comment and it's just all emojis, that's a scam. <laughs> um, but we filtered out most of that stuff. So I hope that answers your question and any other companies that, cause I get it all the time. I'll be walking somewhere and a company will stop me and say, we've been trying to get a hold of you for six months. And trust me, I'm like, well, I would like to talk to you. I mean, obviously that's what we do here is make content about good gear. Um, the, um, but so, you know, I watched your channel and I saw the product. He, he, what he's talking about, I guess, uh, it's a, it's a tremolo arm for a Floyd Rose, even though he said Kaler, it's a Kaler product. I'm probably misinformed a little bit, but it's a Kaler product that you can adapt onto a Floyd Rose, a Floyd, Ro Floyd Rose style tremolo or Floyd Rose tremolo. And what it does is like the tremolo arm straight down, it's blocked hardtail and you could, you know, you kind of pull it up and you're ready to rock and you got tremolo. I watched your video cause I, I follow your channel. So I saw it. So I'm very aware of the idea. Um, but like I said, as, uh, that just contact that email address and, uh, and, and I will forward your email as well. So I hope that helps. I know that sounds crazy. Uh, so, uh, uh, okay. Uh, all right. Let's, uh, let's go to some more questions. Let's go back onto the, the guitar side of things. Um, we have, we need some water is what we need. Steve says new guitar day, D'Angelico mini DC XT in blonde, regular eight ninety nine. It says Dino. I think it's uh, whatever. 629. Question. Okay. I have a Kiesel where the 10 gauge E string locking thumb screw on tuner is always loose. Any reason why that might be? Could be stripped out, man. Those look, the, the locking keys, uh, Kiesel's locking keys. Obviously, Kiesel's not manufacturing uh, 
tuning keys. Um, I, I, uh, this is a great time to segue into a cool little th tidbit for you guys to know. One of the cool things that I was able to uh, pull off being a YouTuber is that I've now been to 36 factories or larger shops around the world and seeing how those guitar companies make their, their products. And um, I did that because, you know, I have this weekly show where you guys are pinging my brain all the time. And I always think like, well, I'm not very smart, but if I go do it, maybe I can tell you what I saw. <laughs> um, so let me tell you an interesting tidbit that I can, I might help you guys. Um, of all the factories around the world that I've been to, and uh, um, there are very few to none. And I, I almost want to say none, but there are very few that actually have a machine shop. Okay, it's very, very few. Even Fender, they don't have a necessarily a machine shop. What they have is they have the press that can do the bridge plates and they have the press that can do the trays for the output jacks on the strats. Um, I don't believe they have a press for the tele output tray or the circle. I think that's actually brought in outside. You know, they, they buy that. Um, but there is no chroming facility there either. So when they do that stuff, they send it out to be chromed, um, which is why I believe the the Fender made amplifiers. A lot of them went to uh, like the Hot Rod Deluxe went from a chrome face to a black face because they were sending out to be chromed. And then when they sent the, when they finally said, hey, let's make them in Mexico, they just paint them black because it's easier than having chromed. Um, but reason I tell you that is because a lot of manufacturers will tell you like, oh, it's, they brand their tuning keys. It's just a thing, right? Um, Kiesel puts Kiesel on his tuning keys, but obviously Kiesel isn't making those tuning keys. Uh, Power Smith doesn't make their tuning keys. They have those made somewhere else as well. Those aren't manufactured in-house. Um, uh, so a, a lot of companies, it's easier to understand because when you see a Grover tuning key or a Goto tuning key or like a branded tuning key, like a, like a Cluson or a Schaller, you're like, okay, that's who's making it. So with Kiesel, they're buying those tuning keys from someone. I don't know who, but that at the Kiesel Connect experience, maybe that's a good question in the factory to ask. Um, it's not a question I asked when I was in the factory because I already knew that they weren't making the tuning keys. So a question you would want to ask is, um, and I, not you, but somebody if they're watching this video, um, is who makes your tuning keys? I'm sure he'll tell you. So what I'm basically trying to tell you, uh, Steve, is that on your uh, your Kiesel tuning key, it's probably defective. So it, it's probably stripped out or cross-threaded or, you know, ton of things. So you need to get it replaced. Um what I would suggest to you do suggest to you is email the Kiesel customer service. I believe it's one person. <laughs> so don't call sales because it's not a sales issue. It's a customer service issue. Um, but anyways, you call them or email them and say, look, I have a defective uh, tuning key and I'd like to get a new one. Um, unless you're, you know, I don't know what the warranty is on that. I don't know how long you've had the guitar. Maybe that's a conversation to have too. Hey, is this under warranty? Can I get a replacement? Uh, tell them the issue. There you go. The other, so I'm going to give you two solutions to this problem, by the way. That's one. Definitely call them and um, and see if they can get that uh, rectified for you because that's that's important. Whether you have to buy a tuning key, hopefully they won't say anything crazy like, we only sell them in sets. <laughs> uh, but uh, but ho hopefully, like I said, what can we do to get this resolved is usually the terminology I use. Like, hey, I need this fixed. The other thing that's going to be a weird suggestion but I've actually had it work so many times, it's always worth trying, is um, you can disassemble the tuning key, okay? So obviously it should be three, is it three pieces? I can't remember if it's compression fit or if there's a screw. It's two to three pieces. So it's be screw, the the base with the shaft, and then of course the, the, uh, the, the nut. The nut. Um, you could take it apart and reassemble it, Sometimes that fixes it, okay? The other thing that might fix it, believe it or not, is take it apart and the one next to it, or whichever one's the same height if they're staggered, and swap them and put them back together. And again, it kind of fixes it. Um, because sometimes the misalignment is because the tuning key is slightly crooked and there might be a piece of wood, like a little wood shaving in there that's causing the tuning key to not sit flush. And it's just when you're turning the locking unit, it's just not threading up correctly. Now, the downfall of this is that could be the problem, like I said, and then you've now cross-threaded it. It's not your fault, you know, because it was misaligned. But I would try that. Why? Because it's free and it takes a minute of your time other than you're going to have to restring your guitar. That's what I would do is try that. Um, so those two solutions would be what I would recommend. And in my experience now is... It's getting to the point where 
it's getting harder and harder because all these manufacturers, whether they're made in the USA or not, or made in England or made in Japan, this, the, the tuning keys, the bridges, everything is coming from a not great, uh, not great, uh, you know, not great technical specs and, you know, tolerances for manufacturing. So you're going to see, you're going to see, you know, you know, that problem. It's just the downfall of it. All right. I uh, hope that helps. <laughs> Vim69 said, congratulations on the Gretsch. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, it was funny. I didn't mean to buy it. I, I honestly, uh, I, I like I said, I emailed him and I'm like, you know, I was like, hey, if you're running any, de-, I was like, basically, like I've told you guys in the past, if you if you make me a deal, I'm gonna figure out a way to justify this. So when he came back and he's like, yeah, we can do a good deal, I'm like, oh man, I was hoping you're gonna say no. I hope I was hoping they were gonna say, uh, so so you know, this particular Gretsch I wanted, they were the only one who had one that I saw. Everybody else had a different version of it. No one had it. So, um, I, I was like, I, I, I thought they'd email back like, sorry, can't do anything right now on it. And I'd be like, okay. And then I would just wait and I'd be like, I don't need it. But when he's like, yeah, we'll, we'll make you a smoking deal. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> but also amazing. Thank you. Uh, grumpy. My guitar says I've got a PRS SE swamp ash special on the way. Price was right. Couldn't help myself. Uh, the weight is killing me. Well, good timing because, um, I'll have the, um, I'll have the, uh, uh, that's the guitar I'm using to round over the edge of the fretboard. So I'll have that for you. So you can watch that video. And, uh, I think you'll like it more after you round over the fretboard edge. One of the only critiques I had that was negative about the guitar was the fretboard edge is pretty sharp on that guitar. So other one than that, I thought was a fantastic instrument. So if you want to roll your edge, uh, the fretboard, you can. Fret Level Midnight says traded traded a heavily upgraded IV LP and an amp on uh, and odds and ends. Okay, so more stuff for a Sunburst Bernie clone. Thanks to Zims. Do you have a favorite Japanese market brand? Ibanez. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, so. The made in Japan guitars obviously are fantastic, right? So, I mean, obviously I like the the Jacksons. I like the FGN guitars. I like uh, the Gretsch, the Gretsch I bought. This is a a made in Japan Gretsch. Um, uh, There's a ton of made in Japan guitars, but I'm a huge Ibanez fan. Uh, The Ibanez, you know, Ibanez to me, when people like they, they, when people talk about Gibson and Fenders and, you know, when they grew up, those were the iconic brands to own. For me, it was Ibanez. Uh, just because the, you know, stores I went to when I was a kid where I lived mostly had off brands you'd never heard of. Most of the brands in the stores around town that I went to, those brands weren't in guitar magazines. <laughs> so it's like, you know, everybody had brands that no one ever heard of. Um, and, uh, for the most part. And so one of the stores in town, they had Fenders and Ibanez. Uh, that was the store, you, you know, that was the premium is to go in Ibanez. And Ibanez to me at the time, all the players, um, remember I started guitar in 89. So 89, think about that. I mean, Passion Warfare comes out from Steve I. You have them doing, uh, Warrant is playing Ibanez at that time. Uh, Paul Gilbert's playing Ibanez. Joe Satriani is playing Ibanez. Um, uh, Pat Metheny is playing an Ibanez. Frank Gambale is playing an Ibanez. Uh, Jennifer Batten is playing an Ibanez with Michael Jackson, basically. So it was, um, it was like Ibanez was uh, premium, but also obtainable premium. Like all the brands, like I told, I think I've said uh, ESP guitars. I, I never, you know, you had to drive to Hollywood Guitar Center, uh, drive all the way to California. You could see like, you know, some ESPs in the wall that you weren't allowed to touch. And Jackson even made in, I didn't understand because I was a kid. So when I went to the store that carried Jackson in town, they had U.S. Jacksons and then they had the professional series, which were made in Japan. Um, but to me, Jackson's just was, it was just unobtainable. It was expensive. So I didn't know enough about the brand to go, oh, there's a sub tier of Jackson that's more affordable in, in the price range of Ibanez. So to me, Ibanez was the kind of guitars that were 700 bucks. So 
Bruce says Ibanez is uh, 100% outsourced manufacturing. Uh, not anymore. At the time, back in the day, yeah, Japan. Now uh, Ibanez has a uh, factory in Indonesia, uh, which is Hashino. So Ibanez is... 100% outsourced, but think of this, Ivan is isn't even a company, it's it's a brand that they stick on guitars, Hashino is the company, but Hashino owns the Indonesian factory, and um, and uh, so yes, but uh, that is, that's not a line that I understand, uh, in other words, I, I, you know, like, this company doesn't make this guitar, this company hasn't made, that's like everybody at this point, <laughs> I mean, Cortex probably making 300 different brands at this point. It's probably, probably so crazy. So, but yes, but I, Ibanez was a, a premium brand to me as a kid, but it was an, it was obtainable premium. Uh, what I mean by, like I said, $700 back in the day. That was crazy expensive. I couldn't afford that, by the way. But I'm just saying, when you saw $700, you're like, oh, okay, so three times what I have. Where if I saw a guitar that was $2,000 or $1,000, like I've talked in the past, that this guitar was too expensive. So... That's that's my affection for Ibanez. So when I got my first Ibanez, that was my my Ibanez. My first Ibanez was my first, um, uh, my first, like expensive, like a uh, crazy, you know, like I got a guitar. I got, and I, it was a brand that, you know, people would know. <laughs> so, like, so there there you go. Um, Okay, so uh, Aussie says, hey, Phil, thanks for the uh, next shim advice. Oh, we talked about that earlier already. Okay, last week, uh, sent you pics. Uh, I got them. We talked about that. Bridge is on slightly crooked. Low E string keeps rolling off the fretboard. Past 12 fret solutions. I have a video. I will index it right here. It's bay, uh, when I do the timestamps. I have a video. That's what you need to do, especially now that you shim the neck. You're going to have to adjust that neck a little bit side to side. So I have a video on that uh, for anybody that uh, wants to search it now while you're watching live. It's like uh, how to fix the bad alignment on a Fender or Squire guitar or something like that. Just type in Phil McKnight and string alignment will come up. Um, uh, that's uh, one of the only cool things. Uh, so, you know, that's how I search my own videos. So, you know, if you just type in Philip McKnight and then the subject of whatever you're looking for, it'll find that video no matter what I title it because of the way we, we uh, uh, what do you call that? You know, not title it. What do you, what do you call it? We put in these sub searches for it and it'll come up that way. Okay. Uh, Cat's Music Journey says, is that a Fishman loud box behind you? Are you just happy? Am I, or am I just happy to see you? Is that the joke? Uh, <laughs> I didn't have the money for an a a e r, so I was a being that, and the Bujera a e r copy went with the Bujera. What do you think about the LB, the lunchbox? Uh, yeah, this is the lunchbox mini, and I just recently did a video of the micro, and the micro is really cool. I like the mini one percent better, and. Uh, and uh, it's one of those things, like if I had the micro and not the mini, I would be like, I like the micro. But having both, I'm like, I like the mini just a little bit more. But the micro is hella cool if you don't want 1% better. <laughs> it's just a little fuller sounding. Um, uh, let's see. And, uh, uh, oh, so yeah, absolutely love it. It's my favorite thing. The reason it sits there is because that's like my go-to amp for all my acoustic guitars and any of my electrics with the piezo system, piezo system. So yeah, I absolutely love it. Um, AR, AERs are really nice too. I've played those in the past. They're awesome, but ex expensive. But what I love about the Fishman Loud Box is I think this one's $399 or $499. I think it's $499. So for that price point, it's very reasonable for how good it is. So, um, okay, um, smooth, smoother clo clothes. Anyway, says, hey, Phil, do you have any recommendations for pickup winding machines looking to get in ho ho a hobby? Yes, I like the Mojo Tone winder. You can get it from Mojo Tone or Stu Mac. Um, and the reason I say that is because sometimes Mojo Tone is out and they sell it through Stu Mac. Uh, so you can get a Stu Mac. Uh, it's my absolute favorite one. Um, I do have a couple different winding machines, um, so you know. Um, the Shatten Winder is cool. There's a reason why I like the Mojo Tone one. I think it's uh, for the price. 
uh, it's a fantastic quality and it's really um, accurate. And um, one of the things that's tough about winding pickups, um, first, you know, you learn to do it and then you're like, okay, I got this down. But the consistency is a killer. One of the things that I have to do, and I, th I think I told you guys this before, is like when somebody buys a set of pickups that I make, I make a bunch of sets. We've been talking about what to do with all the unused pickups. I have a bunch of pickups that they're good. I just, I'm matching the sets up that I'm sending you guys. And um, it's the old school way of doing things. It's kind of like, I remember when Mike Saldano told me that, you know, the, the SLO 100s, he would, and whenever they would finish the amp, he would take it into a quiet room in the shop and he would swap out 12AX7s and play all by himself quiet in the room and find that the 12AX7 had the least amount of noise to get the noise level down. And of course, when he sold the company to Boutique Amp Distribution, which is now currently who makes it, um, Pete, the designer there who now designs for uh, Bad Kid Amps, um, he put DC heaters on the amp and that solved the problem. Uh, the reason I tell you that is that's something that smaller pickup builders have to do where bigger pickup builders don't do this. Big, bigger pickup builders will use um, technology to get consistency, <laughs> right? Where I do, I'm almost like Mike Saldano where I'm winding a pickup and then I'm loading it into the cartridges and I'm playing it on a guitar and I'm listening and I'm like, okay, compare to the other one and compare to the other. And I go, oh, these two sound the best. <laughs> and I put these two together. Um, so that's the winder I like. Let me share uh, with you guys um, the Mojo Tone winder uh, because one of those things, I I own a couple of them and they've definitely gone up in price. Uh, Stu Max got them for six fifty, but there's one on Reverb for six, man, they've really gone up. Amazon, what? Let's look at this. In stock, ships and so. Oh, so I wonder if Mojotone's got it cheaper. So here's one on the uh, Amazon for five fifty nine, so five hundred sixty bucks. This is the unit right here. It's got a great display. It works great. I changed out the knob for a different knob that I like better when I turn it. Um, but this is the unit I like. Let me go back. I wonder if it's any cheaper if you get it actually on Mojo Tone's website. No, it's cheaper on Amazon than on Mojo Tone, and it ships from Mojo Tone. I love the world we live in. Mojo Tone shows it here six hundred dollars, temporary out of stock. This is what I'm saying. This is the problem. This is why a lot of people buy it on everywhere else because they're always they're always out of stock. But uh, for those of you that are interested, that's the one I recommend. It is a lot of money, uh, but. You know, I've tried a ton and I'm not saying it's the best one, but I will say I love its consistency, its quality. It's a great machine. You're, if you haven't seen it, it's like a little, obviously now you've seen the red box, you'll start noticing every pickup, small pickup winder, who, whoever they are, they got it in the background somewhere. That's what they're using. It's a really go-to. It's really kind of really changed uh, to me, uh, you know, the small winding world, right? I look at the small winding communities kind of like the, microbreweries, <laughs> you know, 20 years ago when everybody was starting up a little microbrewery. Um, uh, so uh, Vanilla Slices, what's a roll of copper wire cost these days? I have no idea. I, I buy mine in the bigger spools. Um, during COVID, it was getting crazy because I couldn't get the big spools sometimes. And we buy so much of it. I just don't know. I only see the total bill. So, but I will find out the answer. I need to look at the receipts. It's one of those things. I just don't know. So, uh, Frank says, how do you wind your first pickup? I think I'd, I'd like doing it, but I don't want to jump onto a deep end one day. Um, I would wind the very first pickup is wind yourself a single coil pickup, um, for a ton of reasons. One, it's one, you know, one wire wrapping around. That's a big deal. Um, also it's, a very easy kit to assemble um, for the most part. Um, you can try a P90 as your first one. Stay away from humbuckers at first because they're just going to make you nuts. Uh, <laughs> don't let that be your first pickup. I would I would stay away. Um, but I would say either a single coil or um, a P90 and, uh, and then start there. It's really cool. So it's... It's a fun thing. I I told you guys the story. I my first my first pickup that I ever wound was I want to say 2000 
2005. That sounds right. It might have been 2004. And the very first one I ever wound, what happened was I had a customer and they had a, a let's just say for the argument's sake, a vintage guitar. The pickup was broke, not working. The wire was broken and it needed to be redone. And um, they didn't want, I, my argument was like, get a new pickup. You can get a Seymour Duncan, right? <laughs> just get a new pickup. And this was like, no, I can't get a new pickup. This guitar is special. It needs to be this. And so I was like, okay. So I, um, I did some research and was able to wind a pickup using a, uh, a DeWalt drill. So if you guys don't know, you can just take a DeWalt drill, <laughs> which is what I did. And I put it in a, in a clamp and, uh, I basically wound it on my drill, <laughs> right? Um, this is, think of this, this is pre YouTube. YouTube was 2006. So I didn't even find a YouTube video. This is back when, you know, you read your reviews on Harmony Central and you could find pages where people would talk about it. So I read how you did it. And then I tried to put it together and I wound this pickup and it was a nightmare and it took forever. And I did it a bunch of times. And, and, um, what was nice for me at the time, this was nice. One, I was able to, to take care of the the customer I was able to make the pickup, but the important part for me looking back now was he had no reference of sound. In other words, he didn't know what the original pickup sound like. This was a sentimental, like heirloom type guitar. And so I wound it a couple times and finally, I think I got it right. And then I put it in and he played it and he's like, that yeah, sounds good. And I was like, yeah, it sounds good. And so that was the level, the bar that I had to meet. <laughs> was it sounds good <laughs> but i i know i now know it could have been totally so far from what the original pickup sounded because i didn't even know at that time that there was like farm varve or enamel wire i didn't know you know that i should be that there's a certain amount of wines you know i didn't even think to take the wire off and like weigh it and see if i could calculate how much wine's in it i just like okay i bought some wire <laughs> <laughs> this is wire it's copper <laughs> and i basically wound the pickup and i was like it works and that's the that's the process and then i didn't really have any uh desire to do that again except for the fact that i had a guy who was winding pickups for me and again we got into a situation where he couldn't do it and we had some customers that need some wound pickups so i go okay i'll wind some more and then um and that's just how it works. And I would do them periodically through over the years, but never any real, you know, like this is a desire to do this. Um, it was more of a, a lot of repairs. There's a lot of types of repairs I love to do, but a lot of types of repairs I did just because fundamentally it was just, you know, cost effective to do it that way or time uh, effective to do it that way. And then after you teach yourself a skill like that, you just have the skill and then you're like, might as well do it. So, so there you go. The world we live in, boy, do I, boy, do I love YouTube now <laughs> versus the old days of just looking up a forum or looking up something late night. Here's somebody telling you how to do it. <laughs> let's see what they, let's see what they say. Uh, M. Karras says, I bought a power electric brand guitar. One showed up, Powers Electric brand guitar one showed up in my local guitar it's a dream to play complete hollow body with no sound holes learned about it watching tim pierce video oh cool um why do i not know that video i usually watch all his videos and i can't believe i don't know that video huh i'll have to check it out for sure okay um we have i don't know they jumped around we missed something okay why am i missing some um, the outdoors lab says, Hey, Phil, thanks for all the tips you've given on how to get deals. Just, just score to use Jackson dinky and mint condition, save $200. It's nice. That's a great guitar too. I like the Jackson dinky. I've always loved that guitar shape, the, the body. I've always had a big affection for smaller body guitars, even though I'm a bigger guy. It's kind of a weird thing. I don't know why I just like the way I like, I like my arm down this, this, I don't like it up like this. That's, that's why, like I said, Gretsch was always a guitar I wanted, but again, like an acoustic, my arm kind of comes up and I kind of like it to come down a little bit for the most part. Uh, Dr. Diff says happy new year's, Phil. Is that already saying happy New York? No, happy NY. Happy New Year's, Phil. I have a stage right amp. I upgraded with a Jensen 12 inch speaker, 25 watt Alnico, but saw sweet 
H2O have a B-Stock Marshall. Okay. Oh, Swat, Sweetwater. Uh, that's funny. Sweet H2O. I'm like, what the hell are you saying? <laughs> it says, I saw Sweetwater has a B-Stock Marshall one watt tube amp with an eight inch uh, selection at a good price. You think I'd be happy with it. I did not like the Marshall one watt amp. Um, the, the, I had the head. My issue was, um, and I, and I've said this many times, uh, just to be clear. And I thought I was clear in the video, but I want to be clear now again, which is I had the original version of that amp that was made in the UK, but I don't care if it was made in the UK. What I care about is the original version had a gain control on the clean channel. And from that, you were able to juice the gain a little bit to get the clean channel to sound a little bigger. And on the version they make now, the volume is just like just a volume. I think the presence control is hooked to it. And to me, the clean is so, so thin and so bright that I want that. That amp to me is a perfect as a pedal platform. It's got a little digital reverb, a little one watt amp, a little quiet at night kind of thing, run some pedals through it. And I found that just having no control of your clean sound at all with an amp that doesn't have any kind of beefiness to it, it really was a little not, you know, not great. And I would imagine, and I could be totally wrong, that it's much worse with an age speaker than it was when I was running it through a 112 and 212 cabinet. So I'm going to say no. The only thing I liked about that amp is that it said Marshall and it looked cool, <laughs> but I did not like anything about that. A lot of people gave me hell on that video about the distortion. You're like, Hey, the distortion is great. Why? I'm like, yeah, it's, it's fine. But, but my biggest issue, which I think again, wasn't clear was they already made a version of the amp that was freaking awesome. I understand that was made in England and this one's now made in Vietnam, but just copy the, send the one you made in England, send that to Vietnam, <laughs> go make that, <laughs> send that out for, for the price they did, but instead they changed it and they made it worse. So, uh, that's my uh, opinion. But so, you know, some people love it as, uh, we talked about at the beginning of the show, uh, some, you know, it didn't work for me, but it could work for you. But in my experience, I did not love it. And I really, really, really wanted to. So there you go. Uh, and if I was going to get a one watt amp again, I would definitely get the Black Star. That's for sure. Compared for that for that price point and those price points. Um, let's see. Smooth. Oh, we already did smoother. Good. Uh, history will vindicate Thrawn. You guys in your names. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, Phil, what do you, uh, what to do with cheap bass cabinet with a blown speaker? Oh, 2011 GC era acoustic 410. Wanted to sell it because it's bulky and heavy, but replacement speakers cost as much as the cabinet. Yeah. Um, it's tough. You know, when you have a cabinet like that and you, you want to sell it, the sad thing is, is that Here's what's funny, okay? Um, I don't know what you're going to get for it, and it's not going to be a lot. But as dumb as this sounds, the cabinet's probably going to be easier to sell. I don't care what brand it is, okay? I don't care if it's Acoustic or Behringer or whatever. If it's a premium brand, it's going to be easy. But I'm, we're talking about non-premium, you know, expensive brands. Um, in my experience, if you have an amp with a blown, or cabinet with a blown speaker, and you're, the math isn't working, right? So in other words, like you said, if I buy a new speaker, it's as much as the damn cabinet costs. If you try to sell that like on Craigslist or offer up and you say, Hey, I have cat, you know, I have a 112 guitar cabinet with blown speaker. I have a 410 with blown speakers. I have a 115 blown speaker. Um, you won't get anybody to buy it. But if you take that blown speaker out, all the blown speakers out and you say, I have an empty cabinet and this is the price you can get somebody to buy it. I don't know why that is, <laughs> but you need to take out the blown speakers. Sadly enough, uh, I don't know what's, you know, that you'll have to see what's recyclable from the blown speakers and stuff. But, um, but that, that is what I've learned that helps a lot is that before I would sell a defective cabinet, I would just sell a working cabinet without, a, or sorry, before I sell a cabinet with a defective speaker, I would sell a working cabinet with no speaker. Um, it will, it will sell easier for sure. Cause there's, oh, cause now you're looking for a different customer. You're not looking for somebody who's like, okay, I'll buy that. And then I'll figure out how to fix it. You're looking for somebody who's like, I got a bunch of 10 inch speakers. Maybe I'll throw in this cabinet, right? That's what you're hoping for. You're hoping for somebody who's got the speakers and they need the cabinet and same logic. They're like, you know, the, you know, uh, but you're not going to get a lot for it. I don't know what that is, but it's not going to be a lot. 
but that's how you'd get rid of it. Uh, I'd also check the speakers thoroughly to make sure that they are blown. So um, this is where uh, some stuff like this I always get a little nervous because later I'll be watching the show in a couple of days and somebody in the comments will say something way smarter than me. And I go, oh man, I wish I would have said that. Plus, I wish the person who asked me the question would have saw this. Um, one thing you want to do is let's make sure make sure that the speakers are blown. There's a couple easy ways to test, test that. There's a fast, easy test to check a blown speaker. You can go on YouTube, just type in blown, check a blown speaker with a 9-volt battery. It's how you do it. You take two wires, you stick it on the 9-volt battery, you watch the cone go out, and watch it, right? And if it does, it's not blown. I would check to make sure, uh, especially since uh, bass cabinets, bass guitar cabinets, affordable cabinets like that, expensive cabinets, it doesn't matter. They all tend to use, um, they use a, a way they protect the speakers is inside the cabinet. Sometimes they use a, what looks like a fuse. It's actually a car dome light, an old car dome light, you know, back when they were not LEDs. Um, and what they do is they wire sometimes one or two car dome, car lights, you know, the light in your car. That's just Usually, because I, I, the reason I know this is because I don't, like I said, I don't repair amps, but you know, I've been in bands and you blow stuff, and that's where you go to get them. You went to AutoZone, <laughs> so you had to go to get them out of AutoZone. And then what they'll do is they'll, they'll wire one or two of those bulbs essentially uh, into uh, the the mechanism where the the, ca the speaker cables go in, and what that's they're there to stop the speakers from blowing. And it's very inexpensive. So like I said, it's not just an expensive cabinet will do it. Sometimes cheap cabinets will do it too. So what I'm basically saying is before you sell this thing off at a loss later and lose everything, maybe take some time, take the speakers out, check them. If it's, you know, check the speaker, that's an easy thing to do. Like I said, nine volt battery, you can do that very easily and check it. And if you don't know how to do that, just what I just said, you're going to put it on the, on the, on the, on the wires, the plus, uh, the uh, hot and the negative, and it's going to, go outward. And if it doesn't work, flip it, go the other way. Then it should go inward. I, I believe if you flip it and then, um, but like I said, check for fuses or those car, car dome lights. And, um, and if it's those bigger lights, the reason I'm telling you those lights is because, uh, you know, you're going to go like, Oh, uh, I need a fuse, but you really need those lights and you have to solder them in. They usually solder them in. They're not like popped in like on prongs, like, like a fuse. But either way, fix that cabinet if you can, um, because it is shocking in modern cabinets now to see blown speakers. It's just not, like I said, they, they know how to make speakers now, uh, cabinets, even inexpensively well. <laughs> so so that's what I would do. All those things I would check and uh, and then follow, and then follow the other device if this if that advice doesn't turn anything. Hopefully you'll save some some gear and some money. Uh, okay. Um, uh, you know what I need to do is you go back to the main page. Hold on a second. Let's go back to this and okay. This came from zombie guitar company, zombie guitar company, which is, uh, is my daughter's favorite t-shirt. Uh, she stole it from me. <laughs> So my daughter is funny because she's like, um, she's like five foot one and, and she weighs like nothing, but she'll wear my giant shirts like, like a whole, like a, just that, like she wears big baggy clothes. So that's her thing. So she, she has a, my zombie guitar company shirt with the mystery van. So I, I just always think of that. Every time I see her wear the shirt, I go, oh yeah, I remember when zombie sent me that shirt and she took it. Uh, it says, what are your thoughts on Fender offering a mod shop? Yeah, so Fender has a mod shop, right? It looks like uh, you pick the body, the paint, the neck. Yep, hardware. They build it. Uh, I did a sample build, $2,000. GNL is already doing this. Yeah, it's kind of the same concept. <clears throat> what do you think of the mod shop? I Obviously, I love that stuff, especially since Fender might stop that one day, and then you'll have these guitars that, at the time, probably won't seem... They'll seem like a poor poor person's... You know, I say, what do they say? A poor man's... Uh, uh, custom shop, but then may turn out to be valued like a custom shop because it's something you can't do anymore. Essentially, Fender got smart. The mod shop is really, um, I believe when they start, because they've had the mod shop for many, many years now. Um, the mod shop started, according to the people at Fender, I know, because of Stratosphere, 
right? Um, it's a mod shop. They started selling, Fender wasn't selling necks and bodies for years, years. I think they were selling them up to, and again, you know, trying to do off memory. Uh, they were selling bodies and necks and parts like that up until the early 2000s. Then they stopped and they didn't start back up until like 2014 or something like that. Um, and they started back up because I said, oh, you're going to sell necks and bodies again. And they said, yeah, it's because Stratosphere, which is, if you guys don't know who Stratosphere is, they're an online entity that basically cannibalizes like a, like a chop shop for cars, but for guitars, they chop, they take apart new and used instruments. And I think mostly new, but they do new and used and uh, sell off all the parts. And so people can kind of parts a caster their guitars back together. So Fender um, basically started selling the parts. And then I think the mod shop was like the next inevitable, um, you know, kind of like iteration of that, like let people go on, um, go on our website and build up a, a custom instrument or semi custom instrument. Um, it seems cool. I like the idea. It's, I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, I guess at the core, core of it is, uh, what are my thoughts on it? That's my thoughts. It exists and it seems cool. Um, you know, I like it. I like, I obviously I like unique instruments. So that's definitely something cool. Um, Okay. Um, okay. So this, this question is, Hey, Phil, I dig the show. You guys rock. Thank you. Both of us, me and both these guys, these guys both rock, uh, says, uh, got the Friedman bug thinking of thinking about getting a dirty Shirley. Does the 12 inch speaker sound better than the 10 inch speaker? Um, I believe it sounds better to me. To me, it sounds better. Um, I like 10 inch speakers for when you're playing quieter, uh, they're easier to distort and they're faster to distort with faster, meaning at lower volumes. Right. It, and, and, and the gain control. Right. So to me, and I can't, I can't tell you for a fact, but I would say if I had two dirty Shirley heads, a uh, mini heads on two cabinets, one is a 112 and one is a uh, 110 inch speaker. If we set the gain at, let's say four on both amps, I believe, and I'm pretty sure I'm right that the 10 inch speaker will be more distorted sounding than the 12 inch speaker at that point. And so you have to, you have to turn it up. And that's only a problem if you're on 10 on both, cause you're going to get more distortion out of 10. Um, the 10 speaker to me has a snappier mids, uh, not as much lows, but also a little bit, like I said, more distorted and distorts a little bit more at a lower volume. So that would be why you'd want the, the 10 inch speaker. That's really cool. I think there's a ton of reasons why you want that. Me personally, I like the bigger cabinet, bigger speaker. Um, I'll just get the amp to distort, whether I attenuate it or I want to boost in front of it. I'll figure out how to get there. I, I just want the speaker to sound a little fuller. Um, the only amp I have that has a 110 is my Princeton. That's it. And even my Princeton, I think sounds way better through a 112. So, uh, there you go. So I like 12s. I'm biased. I like the 12s more than 10s. So, so it's like I said, can't say better, but I say I would pick that for sure. Um, and I think the reason you're asking is because the the Dirty Shirley Mini combo comes in a 110. Is that what it is? So I think that that's the answer. And you're thinking about should you get the head in the cabinet? Um, I like it. I like having heads and cabinets over a, ca a one cabinet. So if that helps. Okay. Um all right. And then, uh, Gina short was an early riser question. So I grabbed it. She said, uh, how would you dial in a good tone for an acoustic electric guitar running through an electric amp using the EQ? So we talked last week about adding the EQ pedal to an amplifier, like a, 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 a boss katana or something like that to make it better. Um, with EQ pedals, like if we're using like, let's say the boss, uh, you know, uh, EQ seven band EQ, um, one of the things I like to do is set the volume. If the EQ pedal has a volume, set that to, um, unity gain. Okay. So if you're not familiar with unity, unity gain, if you're not familiar with that term, uh, um, it's used all the time in the pedal areas of, of the world. Um, basically unity gain on any pedal means that when you turn on the pedal and you turn off the pedal, the, the, the volume is the same, even though we're calling it unity gain and not unity volume, but it's called unity gain. So in other words, you know, you step on your, your distortion pedal and you step off of it and the volume is the same. Um, you, you don't feel jump either, either direction. Um, 
that's definitely important with the EQ pedal. So I would set the EQ pedal so that basically, like I said, turn on the EQ pedal, turn it off and you tone change. Sure. But volume change, none. So that's the first place I like to do it. And then from there, you can figure if you want to reduce or increase the actual volume. Okay. Um, but I would hold off to do that until you now set the EQing. I would set the EQ flat. Okay. So, um, so set the EQ flat. And if you do it correctly, I think, uh, like I said, using a boss pedal or something like that, if you're set in the unity volume and you're set the EQ flat, it should be, you turn on the pedal, turn off the pedal and you hear nothing. That's the ideal, perfect world. That's what you want, right? You turn it on, you turn it off. It's like, you like, this is broken. You don't hear anything. Then what you want to do is play for a second with it off and then turn it on and start adjusting, right? Maybe add some low end frequencies. The thing about EQ pedals that, that are tough, um, that is very tough is that people want to just like slam them to the sky, <laughs> slam all the sliders, like just go crazy. Right. And, um, you know, the, the only, the best way, <laughs> the best way I ever was told, uh, to knock it off by a, a very talented musician. Uh, when I was lucky enough to hang out with somebody, the first time I hang out with somebody who's talented to, who kind of dialed me in, they were like, dude, chill out. <laughs> I, was I grabbed a gain. I think I went to 10. They're like, dude, chill. Like, Dude, if you were seasoning your food, if you're cooking, would you just be like, I'm going to dump a whole, <laughs> like a whole can of Old Bay. Like, we just throw that in there, right? Half half a can of pepper, half a can of salt. He's like, no, no. You, lightly season, stir, taste. Lightly season, stir, taste, right? I'm like, yes, okay. So same thing, you can do this uh, same, this analogy works for gain with chorus. Slight adjustment, turn it off, turn it back on. You know, you don't get the dramatic effect, but the dramatic effect is really what you don't want, right? You want the acoustic to sound just more alive. I know that you're going after everybody's going to the same thing. Acoustic sounds a little more dynamic, a little bit more acoustic because most of the time with an acoustic electric, what you're really spending the time to do is trying to make the electric part of the acoustic sound like the acoustic part. So that's what I would do is unity gain, set the EQ flat, and then slowly start adding in some low end frequencies or high end frequencies and start moving them just a little bit. And then if you want to add some volume, great. Now, sometimes you want to take some volume away. It's really good too. And then there you go. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I'm no old bitch says Phil likes his game. Like he likes Thai, li like pepper. Yes. Like 10, <laughs> just let's go. Uh, so there, <laughs> there you go. I hope that kind of helps you start that where to, where to start. Okay. Um, Okay, hold on a second. Um, Tim wants to know if you can do metal on a Vox AC15. I'm looking into them. I sold my Triple X full stack and my VHT special 1830 so I could get my Cube Streets. For busking, but I miss having a good amp, a uh, tube amp for home use. I mean, could you use a Vox AC15 with metal if you put a pedal in front of it? Yes, but I, not on its own. Not enough gain, in my opinion. Not not even close. So definitely need to run some kind of heavy gain pedal through it. Um. So. Okay. Um. All right. Before we go, two things. Uh, okay, we have two things uh, to cover, so let's do them both. Okay, the first one was from Frank who says, Hey Phil, do you think the increasing number and popularity of guitar reviews on YouTube has increased pressure on manufacturers to improve quality? Okay, that's the question. Then there's a little bit more after that. It says, "We are all see we're all seeing pretty high spec and well-made guitars in the sub five hundred dollar market, which seems to put pressure on all makers to improve their game." Um, 
I do not believe that YouTube channels have put any pressure on guitar manufacturers to increase their quality. Um, now, hear me out on the abstract of this. I believe that if they're feeling, if a manufacturer is feeling pressure to improve the quality of their instrument or improve the feature set on their instrument, that pressure comes from their competitor. Now, whether they found out about that competitor through a YouTube video review or YouTube demo, sure. Then therefore, you know, yes, could that happen? Um, there's a reason why, um, so I, I like to speak to things that obviously, you know, when I'm, I'm talking about myself, picking on me, you know, <laughs> isolating what I do, um, cause I, you know, I, I don't know how to judge other people so much for what they do, but the, the reason why, like I said, the reason why I like to do the videos I do, like where I'll go, let's do a, an inexpensive Amazon type guitar. Oh wait, here's the top of line Kiesel. Oh wait, here's the most expensive PRS there is. Oh wait, here's an off-brand, you know, guitar, uh, you know, uh, you know, mid price point is one. I'm, I'm curious about this stuff and, and I think it's fun, but more importantly, I think, um, manufacturers and my experience with them, whether that be a, through a dealer or through, you know, all, all the things I've worked with them over the years or just now doing YouTube content, um, tend to look up and down. I, I, I've used this analogy so many times with actual manufacturers. Manufacturers look up and down. The joke I use is up and down means like this. They look at their top of the line guitar, like use Gibson example. They go, well, this is our premium. Uh, this is a, you know, this is a Max Les Paul. And then this is a, you know, a, a production USA guitar. And then this is our inexpensive USA guitar. And then this is the Epiphone premium. And then they walk down their line and they go, this is how you look at it. And I always say that's up and down. I want to look left and right. In other words, I don't want to look at how Gibson's top of the line to its at least expensive guitar is. I want to look to the left where I see heritage and to the right where I see Sire, you know what I mean? Or another brand, right? I want to look to your competitors. And that's how I think sometimes you can really improve your guitars or your company. Um, you know, uh, if I look at my, I mean, if I look at my best video and my worst video that I perceive, I might go, that's my best video and that's my worst video. But when you see somebody do something and I go, wow, I've never, that video is amazing. I wish I would have made it. You know, making videos is no different than making songs or making movies or anything else or making anything. You see somebody do something, you go, why didn't I think to do that? It's so great. Not so much because you're like, I want to copy them. You're just like, man, that's really setting the bar now, right? Um, I don't want to look at, um, you know, who, somebody who I don't think is doing as well and go, oh, I guess I'm doing it better than them. And I feel good about myself. So same thing with this, uh, this question. I believe that manufacturers got to be competitive like any 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 business and when they see other brands then they they take action but i don't think the youtubers specifically or the youtube videos are anything more than maybe the delivery system of that information um the uh and sometimes the youtube so and the reason i say that also is if we talk specifically about youtube videos i think they're just as horrible as they are good to the manufacturers um I could say, yeah, this YouTuber called out this brand on this thing and now they've improved it. And I've seen that a thousand times on YouTube. We all have, and that's great. And I, I applaud those, you know, YouTubers who have done that or small channels. And so, you know, mostly they're never the big channels. They're always the, you know, the smaller channels that have less on the line to give. You know, it's a lot easier to be bold if you're not, you know, if you're not expecting the whole world to smack you back a little bit. So that's great because then they take those chances. It's great. But... For every instance where I said, I can say a YouTube channel or a gear channel did something that effectively made a company better, right? And using my own and myself as the analogy, like Sweetwater's 55 point inspection, when I did the video saying, I, don't, I didn't think they did anything, you know, they really just came at me and said, look, we're going to try to make that better. And, and that was, uh, it makes me feel good, right? Like, oh, I made a thing and they said, we'll make it better. Whether it got better or not, you know, is is a hard thing to argue, but they did actively try. But for every time I could say that happened with a channel, I think there's a hundred times where channels made things worse because sometimes they just always say everything's great. And then when you say everything's great, the companies believe, like I said, their own hype. It's, it's, it's really crazy. So it's really tough as, and, um, and 
I was on my channel, it was one of the toughest decisions I ever made. We'll end on this point today. The toughest decision I ever made on YouTube for myself was the day I decided that uh, I was doing the, the thing that everyone was doing because I heard it so many times. Like, I only interview, I only review things I like. <laughs> and so when I didn't like it, I would send it back. Some of you guys were, have been around this channel long enough, you know, like I triggered a company that made them nuts when I sent their product back to them. They lost their mind because they were like, they. I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought, oh, I don't like this product. I'm going to send it back to them. Then they got it and they w lost their mind and they got super mad at me because they were offended by this. And I was like, why would you be offended? I I, I mean, I understand I didn't like it, but I mean, I didn't bash it. And the the lesson I learned was not that I shouldn't do that. The lesson I really learned was, no, I, I like the saying, and even though I don't do sports, I love the saying in, in golf, play it where it lands. If I do a video, if I get a product and I don't like it, then they get a video. <laughs> the video is just me not liking it. I don't, I don't like to make those videos. So I really work hard like you all work hard when you're online researching your next guitar. You're trying to approximate this is the right guitar for you. You haven't touched it. You don't know. I do the same thing with manufacturers when they reach out and they say, hey, we have this product we'd like to talk about and have you on my channel. I do everything in my power to kind of calculate what I'm more. Uh, I think I'm really going to like this. I think it's going to be really great. And I think it's going to be a great video and I'm going to do it. But sometimes that stuff shows up and I'm like. I don't like it. And so now it's got to go out there as a, as a product. But my, my point is, I think, uh, does it help? Did, does the YouTube uh, system that we have currently now help the manufacturers improve? I don't believe it does. I think that it creates more hype and more bogus things than it helps. And, um, and that's why I think anytime you see somebody being honest about a, a product, not to being negative. Okay. Negative can be clickbait is, is dramas too, but somebody giving you an honest, thought, whether they say it's honest or not, you don't need them to. When you see the sincerity of that, you know why it's valuable because you don't see it very often. <laughs> so when you see it and, uh, and, uh, that's just my, you know, there you go. This is my two cents on that. Um, we're going to finish with, uh, the positive thing, which is if you guys didn't catch at the beginning, we're doing a promotion with Tim Pierce masterclass real quick. We're going to be doing this for the next couple of weeks. I'll be reminding you guys. So if it's not your payday this time, or it's not in your cycle. This is a, my favorite thing to promote because it's promoting lessons from one of them. I think that actually not what I think one of the best, the best person giving lessons. I, I take his lessons too. If you do it and you use my promotion code down below, you get 30% off and the channel gets a kickback. So of course there's a financial incentive for me for if you do it. However, if Tim Pierce asked me to do it for free, I would do it for free because I, I, I love and respect him that much. And I, and I can give you a thousand reasons why, and maybe I'll do that next week, but I'm just letting you guys know, but more importantly, my favorite thing about this is not that uh, he's so gracious with a discount for you guys. And so gracious, still kicking us a kickback, even though he's giving you a discount, you can do it for two weeks for free and no hard feelings, man. He, he, you know, he, he just, you know, he just loves sharing music with you. So so I'm just sharing that with you, like I said. But the thing I know some of you guys really like last year, which we're doing again this year, is if you sign up, whether you sign up last year or this year, we're doing an online clinic for you guys and we'll be, uh, it's just for who sign up. So there you go. So something to to, to do. Um, and by the way, another reason we're doing this is the feedback last year you guys gave me was so positive, so crazy. So like I said, there there's your, there's your, you know, we're going to do it. There you go. All right. On that note, it's time to let you guys go. So I want to thank you guys so much for, uh, look, I'm switching the cameras again. Thank you guys so much for, uh, helping the channel, promoting the channel, being with the channel, subscribing to the channel, loving the channel, and, uh, now go play guitar. All right, guys. Have a good weekend.